Today, March 2nd, will be marked in Guyana's history books as the election after the first ever no confidence motion against a sitting government in that CARICOM nation. Will President David Granger retain the heart of the Guyanese people to secure another term in office? Or will the voters move towards electing a new president and government to lead them for the next five years? Welcome to the Caribbean Media Corporation's panel discussion, Ghana Votes. I'm your host, Don Paris, and I'll be taking you through the next hour as we discuss election 2020 in Guyana. Well, joining me with me will be two people who have their pulse on what's been happening in Guyana. Our first panelist is no stranger to CMC, and it's always a pleasure to have you here with us. Peter Wickham, a political consultant and the principal director of Caribbean Development Research Services, Cadres. Previously, Peter was a lecturer in political science and research methods in the Department of Government at the University of the West Indies, Cayfield Campus. His organization, Cadres, conducts political polls and research and has worked with several major political parties and governments throughout the Caribbean. Also on the panel is Mr. Cecil Pilgrim, a retired Guyanese diplomat who is Barbadian by birth but spent most of his time representing Guyana. Mr. Pilgrim retired as Guyana's High Commissioner to the Court of St. James after serving in all the communist countries, China, the Soviet Union and Cuba. He was also accredited to what was then Yugoslavia. He was a career diplomat who joined the diplomatic service at Ghana's independence, and he is the husband of the present Consul General, Sita Pilgrim. Welcome, gentlemen. We will begin by discussing how we got here. General and regional elections were actually constitutionally due in Ghana this year, but a little later in the year, in May. Um, so technically, the polls are just about two months early. So we'll start with you, Mr. Wickham. Explain yeah. how we got here. Yeah, I mean, a uh, 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 vote of no confidence. And they are relatively rare in the Caribbean. We, we in Barbados have some experience with the votes of no confidence because we've had a successful one in 1994 that led to the collapse of the DLP government. Um, the peculiar thing with the one in Guyana, though, was that the, it was a, a marginal situation, uh, and essentially it was one person, one person that caused the, the collapse of that government, so to speak. Um, there were some interesting constitutional challenges, and, I, and I'm happy in retrospect that the constitutional challenges happened because I think several things were clarified. So the, the concept of an absolute majority uh, was clarified, the concept of a simple majority was clarified, uh, and the extent to which the constitutional framers, or the, the opinion of the constitutional framers, that uh, one person in a situation like that could bring down the entire government uh, was clarified. Uh, so we had those clarifications that were made, and as a result, we have a successful vote of no confidence. And we're, we're back to square one. Um, the, the extent to which that reflects the will of the people, uh, I think, is ultimately what we will hear tonight. But, but the reality, well, tomorrow night, probably. But the reality is that um, it, it was essentially a vote of no confidence, which is a rare thing in the Caribbean for them to be successful. Mm. And what do you think those clarifications mm. in that particular case, what, mm. what ramifications that has for the rest of the Caribbean? Well, no, I mean, I think in, in every other com country in the Caribbean, a uh, vote of no confidence is, is fairly straightforward. Um, and you understand that even if you have one person more, then you have enough. The thing with Guyana is because they had proportional representation, they, there was a presumption that the, the party, the individuals in the party, did not have the right to vote almost independently because ultimately people elect the party. So the gentleman who voted against his party was elected as part of the APNU AFC. Um, the argument was put by many that he should not have been able to vote against his party. Uh, my view has always been that the Constitution clearly envisions a situation in which an individual or individuals may want to part company from their party, uh, and they moved in that way. So I think the lesson for the rest of us is, is perhaps not a, a strong one, because we have always been clear that people are elected individually. Because Guyana has a different system where you are elected as part of a group, uh, I think that the, the lesson and the implication there is that even in those situations, uh, the individual still has the right to vote uh, independently, uh, and that right would have to be respected. Mr. Pilgrim, mm -hmm. let's pull you in here. Mm -hmm. Of course, you would have seen what was happening in Guyana. What were your first... Um, 
concerns. Concerns. <laughs> when, when, when the no confidence motion was passed, not only in the National Assembly, and then it went on to be verified by the courts. Well, well uh, <coughs> excuse me. as Mr. Wickham has just been saying, it was clear that it needed clarification because the, the Constitution, like so many other constitutions, may say one thing, but then there are certain nuances and they need to be interpreted sometimes. And in this instance, it needed to be interpreted. For example, even though it, the original framers clearly allowed for someone to cross the floor to, to vote against the party to which it belonged, the, it, there is also an ingredient in that arrangement that does not allow you to change parties without so informing the speaker that you intend to do that. So that does, there was that kind of problem. Um, I thought it was an unfortunate situation in that um, it led to political confusion. It led to a long, drawn-out court procedure. And it therefore led to a certain element of uncertainty in the country. Um, now, since it has been legally resolved, I think we've all learned a lesson from that. And that will make it impossible in the future to have a similar situation. And do you think the manner in which Guyanese had to go to the polls early will impact how they actually vote? And this question is to both of you. The, uh, the fact that it was an, an early election that w was um, caused by a no confidence motion, do you think that will impact how they actually vote? Well, I would think that originally, Guyanese would have been somewhat upset by the confusion that resulted from the no confidence motion. But a lot of time has passed. And I, I, I don't think myself that the no confidence motion will have any effect on how people vote today, mm -hmm. or have voted today, because it's now after six. So. And the polls are closed, mm -hmm. we yes. know. Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with that analysis. Um, my, my sense is that people who were inclined to support the uh, APNU-ASC coalition were upset that they were being forced back to the polls. They thought that the, the gentleman was a turncoat and he was you know, spoken of in very disparaging terms. Um, they, they were angry about it, um, but certainly substantial time has passed. I think people who were inclined to put, support the PPP Civic um, were anxious for the opportunity to get out and vote early. Uh, they felt the government had brought down, had been brought down and there was a triumph. But I, I feel that the, the time period has passed that has diffused so much of that anger that I think that ultimately we are back at a stage where people are voting on the basis of two leaders and two parties, well, two, two coalition groups, uh, and you know, trying to determine which is the best for them going forward. But I think the, the sting of the vote of no confidence has ultimately withered away to, to a large extent. So Peter. Mm -hmm. Do you have any predictions at this stage about who will <laughs> emerge victorious yeah. at the end of the book counting? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have to make the point all the time because, of course, you know, the basis for criticism of cadres is often that, you know, we're always wrong and, and you know, it's always wrong. But, you know, we're often wrong. Um, we did a poll that was about a year ago. Um, we would normally say that the shelf life for one of our polls is 30 days. So uh, I would like to think that by now, the poll that we would have done is, is no longer valid, and I'm certainly not sticking my neck out. But I, I got a sense then, uh, we saw that there was a, a very, very limited swing in favor of the PPP, the uh, APNU AFC uh, coalition, um, marginal swing, um, and there was a marginal swing away from the PPP Civic. So our sense at the time was that the status quo was likely to be retained, which means that the government would probably have won back with uh, the same majority that they had going in. Um, my feeling then, and, and I've expressed that you know, very openly, that I felt it was in the interest of the AP and UAFC to go back to the polls as quickly as possible. But we had a protracted conversation about registration of voters and about re-registration of house to house and things which, in my opinion, were not germane to the fundamental point that you had a court, you had a court case which ruled that you need to go back to the polls in three months. And my thing is you go back to the polls because my feeling was that they would have won anyhow. Um, 
I really don't know what the situation is currently. Uh, I haven't done polls since, so I certainly wouldn't want to stick my neck out. But certainly, if we were going to look at the situation where we polled a year ago, we were seeing um, ultimately a, a re retention of the status quo, suggesting that Guyanese were prepared to continue giving the um, APNU, AFC, an opportunity. Um, my sense was that, you know, normally you, you, you give a government five years uh, or at least ten years to see what they can do uh, and the feeling was that it was early days yet. Um, the thing for me though is that I, I do feel that the the whole episode was a good signal and a good shake-up for the AP and UAFC uh, and under President Granger. Uh, I appreciate that President Granger has been ill and that is certainly distracting and with good reason but ultimately, there was a lethargy, I think, which needed to be remedied. And I'm hoping that the shakeup of the, uh, the no-confidence vote would have been enough to send a signal that you know, this lethargy has to stop. Uh, and if, if it is the people of Guyana have assumed that this is now a less lethargic APNU AFC, then by all means, they, they should be able to retain office. Well, the election mm -hmm. is also occurring at a time of an expected oil boom, and mm -hmm. it's predicted that the recent discovery of the oil reserves of Ghana will make a huge impact on the economy, and in fact, it is predicted to grow 85.6%, mm -hmm. a massive jump from the 4.4% in 2019. How do you think this mm -hmm. factored into the election campaign? Mm -hmm. Is a question for me? Yes. Yeah. First you. No, I mean, that, that, that figure that you just gave, you said 80-something, 80 85.6%. I, 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 I have not, in all of my time, known of economies that grow by that size. I mean, we had some, some phenomenal growth in St. Kitts and Nevis recently um, as a result of citizenship sales. But, I mean, this, this level of growth is phenomenal. And um, in the case of Guyana, you're comparing that to what it was a year before, but compare it to what the kind of growth levels that we're having in a place like Barbados, where we are at 0.02%, and trying to see if we can get to 1% growth. And here you have a country that is growing by 85%. So it's phenomenal. I mean, we know why. We know the reason. And a critical question that we asked in our poll was, who do you trust to handle Guyana's wealth? And from certainly from our poll data at the time, people were more confident about the, the leadership of President Granger regarding the handling of the wealth. President Granger is many things, but he is seen as being honest. Uh, and I think that that is something that sold well in his regard when you're talking about the quantity of money that you're dealing with, that a lot of people felt more comfortable with this guy who is seen to be an honest guy. Um, he may take a little long to do things, but ultimately, you know, there's that, that factor. Um, and, and, and certainly, I think that that is, that is the only issue in this election. The, the question is, who will handle this tremendous amount of wealth that has been uh, relatively quickly accrued? Who will handle it better? Uh, and as I said, when I did my survey at that time, you know, people felt that President Granger would have been able to handle it well. The, the, the interesting thing is that were um, President Jagdio in the running to become president again, I think that it could very well have been a game changer. Because while I would say that the trust levels are different, Granger versus uh, Jagdio, the reality with Jagdio was that because he's been president before and because he was seen as being a relatively successful president, um, he negotiated the Amira Falls deal, which was at the time big for, for, for those kinds of, of deals that were being made at that time. Um, people could have considered him worthy enough to, to, to deal with Guyana as well. No. The challenge is that you're dealing with Infran Ali, who is a, a character that is not known politically to Guyanese in the way that President Granger or President Jagdio are known. And I feel that that was the spoiler in the whole thing, that if people were voting Jagdio versus Granger, it would have been different. But ultimately, when you talk about that kind of money, and you say, do you want somebody as experienced as, as, and, and trustworthy as President Granger versus someone in Fernali who is not well known, who is new, relatively inexperienced, and, and I think that the trust issues are, are not equally yoked. Um, it is ultimately, it, it says that you know, it's really only going to likely go in one direction if that is the issue that people decide on. Of course, there could be substantial issues, and um, probably uh, my fellow panelists is in a better position to speak to some of those other issues which have historically been a problem in the case of Ghana. And you can, Mr. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree with mm -hmm. Mr. Wickham mm -hmm. in, in his analysis of trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think there's any reasonable person who would dispute uh, the, the fact that President Granger is by all definitions more worthy of trust mm -hmm. than the intended new president from the PPP. Um, but then, as, as he also said, there are all kinds of ingredients that go together to make up an election process. And in Guyana, they, there are all kinds of other factors, including, of course, let us be very clear, including race. Yeah. Um, now, the, the thing, let me deal with that front on, because race always crops up when people discuss Guyanese politics. But you know, one of the realities of Guyana in terms of race now is that there is no major racial group uh, that has a, a, a majority. Um, it is estimated that, for example, that the middle of the group, the group of people who are neither of cannot be described as African Guyanese or Indo Guyanese, uh, make up about 19% of the population, of the voting population. And then, of course, the Amerindian population as well. So that while race continues to be an important ingredient, there are other factors that you don't have to consider. And, and parties no longer can depend only on racial support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like in any other country, there are a combination of factors that would lead to whatever result we have to, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, on the balance, uh, it would appear that, that the APNU EFC coalition has performed in a way that gives people confidence, and especially President Granger, who is acknowledged and respected for his positions of honesty and integrity. So, barring the vagaries of politics, <laughs> um, we will have to see how the result turns out. Well, we'll go back to a discussion on the two presidential candidates, the two main presidential candidates, a bit later. But there were massive crowds at um, the rallies of the two main political parties. But it's hard to tell, based on the crowds um, at the rallies, who really is more popular or who would win the election. We mm -hmm. already discussed um, predictions mm -hmm. about um, a victor, but what do the rallies, the, the, the number of people showing up at the rallies, tell you about popularity? Um, well, it's always difficult to, to, to see, and I, I'm a person who I would agree that you can't, you know, th these days we have moved from the idea of seeing the number of people at a political meeting to the number of hits that you get on a website and the, the number of people who are following uh, the individual leaders in terms of social media. Uh, when the meetings are broadcast, you know, the number of people are watching. These are all indicators that you can use. Um, but I still am a lot more comfortable with the idea of a public opinion poll as a clear indicator how people will go. Um, Guyanese are hyped about this election, there's no question about it. And when you see rallies of that size, it's also obvious that both parties are well funded. And that to me is always an indicator. If, if both parties are able to raise the kind of money to put rallies of that size on, and, and bear in mind Guyana is not like Barbados, so when someone has a, a, a large rally like that, there's a cost involved of moving large numbers of people, which has to be borne by the party. The fact that both political parties are able to raise the level of funding to bear that cost, it says a lot about the confidence that the private sector and other funders will have in them. And it also says that there are a lot of people out there that actually believe that both parties could win. Um, you know, the, ultimately, you have, let's say you have 20,000 people at a rally. I don't know if those were the kind of numbers that, that they were seeing. But if you were able to get 20,000 people at a rally, it's still a substantially small fraction of the population. So let's not say that that is a clear indicator one way or the other. I just feel it means that both parties have had a lot of hype. Um, you know, T-shirts and, and, and all the paraphernalia was, was available in abundance. Uh, that's something that I particularly don't like, but ultimately it's a reality of Caribbean politics that you, know, you will have your green, you will have your red, and you, know, you have your paraphernalia. Um, that was in abundance in, in thing, and both of the parties were able to put on what appeared to have been well-organized meetings 
Um, they both had fairly active and fertile social media campaigns. So I would say, yeah, that the indicator for me is that you can't use that as a determination of who will win, but certainly it, it says that both, both parties have an equal chance, both parties have a high level of regard. Uh, by people in the private sector who, who will ultimately pay for these things. Historically, is there any correlation between rally turnout and voter turnout? Not necessarily. I mean, um, if you look at the last American election, you know, that was a good example. Um, Hillary Clinton got more votes than Donald Trump, but Donald Trump had larger rallies than Hillary Clinton. Uh, and to me, that was a clear indicator. It is not necessarily who comes to your rallies, the type of person that will come to a rally. Invariably, people who come to rallies are not people who are undecided. They're not marginal people. And I, I often argue that in these countries, 20% of the population determines who will win or who will lose. Um, and that 20% is invariably not interested in coming to a rally. They may watch it online. But none of those people were in those videos that we just saw that would be in the 20% the that's slightly more ambivalent. So we, we need to be careful with that. Um, yeah. Perhaps if I may add. Sure. Yeah. One of the things, of course, to me is that the, site, the, the, the fact that we had a lot of rallies, big rallies, suggests to me that people are interested. Mm. Um, because one of the main problems of political parties sometimes is lethargy. They cannot get people to come out and vote. Now, if you can, if you can excite them sufficiently to attend rallies, perhaps, you may also motivate them to come out and vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding today is that, in fact, there has been a substantial turnout of people to vote. Mm -hmm. And that may be one of the reasons that that may have, happen may have happened is that the rallies excited their interest. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular areas, Peter, um, that we should be looking specifically at um, in terms of strongholds for either APNU mm -hmm. and PPP that we should be looking at in terms of giving us direction on what mm -hmm. the outcome might be? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the thing, the thing with Guyana is that people live on the coast. So, you know, the, the argument that Region 4 is, is you think that's the largest, that's the largest, um, no. yeah, largest section of, of support. And, the, the thing also with the coastal vote is that it is the one that's slightly more inclined to be the middle class and, and you know, kind of like more city uh, votes. Um, and, and that's where one would expect the APNU AFC coalition to be strongest. What's been interesting, though, is that the APNU AFC has focused a lot of energy and, and time and, and, and resources in the uh, hinterland and also in, you know, like Region 9 and Region 8 and, you know, places that people don't normally go. Um, I thought that was an interesting strategy because, you know, my thing is that those, those, those regions are extremely difficult and expensive to access. There's no question that the people up there are Guyanese and they're entitled to, to you know, benefit from some of the, the uh, issues, from some of the funds that are available. Um, there are issues of health care up there that are fairly critical. Uh, and a lot of those were the types of issues that, you know, they tried to deal with, uh, issues of roads, issues of, you know, providing critical resources to, to people in those regions. Uh, and that was part of the strategy of the APNU. Now, my reason for saying it is risky is because you do all of that, but the number of votes you're dealing with is not a whole lot. So if you have a, a PPP civic campaign that's successful in Region 4 and, and, and 5 and, and, and all along the coast, um, you can easily overturn that. And remember, we're dealing with a proportional representation system. So it's not like winning a constituency will help. Ultimately, you need to win overall, uh, and that's how the whole package goes together. But I'm anxious to see when the data comes in tomorrow, whether there has been a significant shift. I mean, in terms of my poll, I definitely saw a significant shift in terms of the votes in those regions, uh, in the hinterland regions and so on. But ultimately, you're still dealing with a small number of people. Um, the people up there tend to vote, and they tend to turn out, and you know they have been made reasonably happy. Uh, and, and the question is whether or not that will be enough to, to, to bring them along. But there still has to be a concerted assault on the coastal regions uh, to ensure that they don't slip. Because if you lose ground in, in, in the coast, then the, the, um, you know, the hinterland and inland votes um, w won't be enough to pull you through. 
Yeah, 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 maybe you can clarify better. If, if, if <laughs> Me not being gay, you. <laughs> no. If I may just add, a yeah. little something, yeah. quite not, not unimportant. Um, the, the, the thing about it is that the the difference between the two major parties is razor thin. Okay. The the present government is was in, has been in power on the basis of five thousand votes, just under that. The difference. Mm -hmm. So that the interior people, mm -hmm. on whom the speaker can say a lot of money has been spent, perhaps that 5,000 in the interior may tip the balance. Mm -hmm. So that, back to my original suggestion, that it is not, even though, yes, you must make sure that your basic uh, supporters come out and vote, the deciding factor, it seems to me, will be those same interior people mm -hmm. and that middle vote that I, I spoke about, the, the mixed, the mixed mm -hmm. vote of 19%. Mm -hmm. So the Guyana's situation is, is, is interesting in the sense that the major parties have to guarantee their base, yes, but then they must seek to get mm -hmm. support from the middle group and the interior people. Well, let's go back to voting today now. Of course, polls are already closed, as you mentioned, at 6 p.m., but there were reports that police on the West Bank of Demerara were summoned to one of the polling stations where residents staged a protest after some individuals allegedly attempted to vote with fake ID cards. Joining us on the phone is Javon Vickery of HGP to give us an update about that situation as well as a roundup of how voting went. Good evening, Javon. Good evening, Javon. Can you hear me? Okay, we'll try to get back. Javon on the phone with Mr. Pilgrim. Um, Peter earlier spoke about some of the issues that um, are in the minds of Guyanese. What do you and your assessment think was issue number one for voters? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the basic issue with any political party is winning. <laughs> okay? You could have the best program in the world if you do not have political power, that program. So I would think that people on either, uh, in all the various parties, woke up this morning wanting to win. Okay. Now, why did they want to win? They want to win because they consider that the, the party that they support will be the party that will best manage the oil, for example, that has the best program going forward for, for, for developing the country and its people, and will guarantee their security, their safety, and their health. Um, and like I said, both all the, the, the supporters of those political parties will, will consider that it is their party that can best guarantee these, these requirements. So th that is what I think that voters in Georgetown would have awakened this morning, like the awakened in any country for that matter. Well, mm -hmm. um, you spoke about, uh, we both spoke about the oil boom. How mm. important do you really think that the average Guyanese saw that as an issue? Is that something they sat down and considered um, when they decided who they wanted to vote for? I would think in a, in, in a total sense, I don't think anyone in Guyana, and I apologize if anyone disagrees, I don't think anyone in Guyana fully understands at this moment in time what that oil wealth will mean. If, if assuming you, know, you hear all kinds of figures about oil eh? and, and the wealth accruing, one of the, one of the figures that I um, was exposed at some stage, spoke about the oil producing the value of 200 million US dollars per day, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think anyone in Guyana understands the dislocations 
that enormous wealth like that will have. Uh, and, and I don't think any, uh, well, I'd be very surprised if people that have sat down in Guyana and worked out exactly how many schools we'll get in our area, what health, but they know it's a tremendous amount of oil. They know it, the value is, is enormous and they want to see it well managed without corruption and in, in, in a way that benefits all of the people of Guyana. Mr. Fogo, sorry to yeah. cut you there, but we now have Javon Vickery on the line. Javon, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Can you tell us a bit more about the protest on the West Bank of Demerara earlier today? Well, what had happened this, well, sometime between this morning and into midday, uh, there were reports of a woman who attempted, who allegedly attempted to vote twice. Um, the, the allegations is that she was at a polling station early in the morning and she had returned to vote a second time. There were some, I, I'm not sure if it was a polling agent or if it was somebody who had seen her before. They saw her and they pointed her out to the, uh, the Guy Elections Commission agent. That person quickly pulled her out of the line and I think upon examination they realized that there was some sort of uh, attempt to commit fraud. Uh, she was quickly escorted out of the station by police, taken into the police van, and then she was taken to the police station. Uh, throughout this entire process, at the time that she was uh, arrested, she has been saying that uh, she didn't vote. She's been denying the allegation, but uh, this caused some amount of discomfort to persons who were at the polling station. Uh, right now, um, what has happened is that leaders from both sides of the APNU AFC coalition and the People's Progressive Party were at the scene. Um, what eventually happened was that there was a bit of a back and forth between the two. And as most people would know, in Ghana, this is a very, very, very um, sensitive uh, time when it comes to the matter of race. And so a lot you see right now, um, I, I we have a reporter that is out there at the moment, and what the feedback I've gotten is that, you know, they're trying to quell the situation because it's getting, it might, might not get out of hand eventually. Were there any other concerns raised by voters at the polling stations, and uh, how did the Ghana Elections Commission respond to those? Well, earlier this morning, one of the things that the, uh, many voters would have uh, complained about was the time that they were, the, the time it took for them to cast their ballot. Uh, for me, I can tell you personally, when I went to my polling station uh, 15 minutes before the open at polls, one of the things that happened was that it took me like 45 minutes to get into the polling station. While I, when I got in there, um, Clearly, you could have seen that there was some sort of confusion among GCOM. But what GCOM has said is that they're aware of some of these issues and they're going to deal with it. They haven't said anything definitively as yet. There is a press conference at 8.30, and they'll hopefully deal with those issues. Overall, how did the voting process go in Ghana today? Is there any indication of um, what the voter turnout was like? Has there been any feedback from the election observers? We know we have groups from CARICOM, Commonwealth, the Carter Center, among others. The Carter Center and the European Union uh, were the two uh, groups that we spoke to um, while they were in the while they were while they were observing. Um, one of the things that they both said was that the process was smooth. There were hiccups, there were complaints made to them, the things that they've noticed, but they didn't go into details of what they actually saw on a preliminary basis. What they said to us is that they're going to do a full analysis of all 10 regions, and of course, they're going to release that to us. But overall, they said that for them, was the GCOM conducted themselves professionally, voters were allowed to vote, uh, in terms of the attendance, I, I can't say. From in the city, it seemed early morning, like a lot, not a lot. Of, some parts of the city, a lot of people turned out, and then some parts they were kind of 
it was kind of questionable. But of course, polls started from 6 a.m., closed at 6 p.m. So I'm sure that persons throughout the day got a chance to cast their ballots. Well, we had over 600,000 people eligible to vote. So many votes to count. Do you have an idea of when the counting will actually begin? Well, well, what normally happens, well, GCOM said, they, GCOM said to us prior to elections that they're looking to do it as the soon as possible time. Um, but, um, this is my second elections coverage, and I can tell you that it takes sometimes a week. Um, sometimes it takes five days, four days, five days. Um, but hopefully, hopefully within by Wednesday, hopefully by Wednesday, if they have all their eggs in a basket, I guess. Um, because there's, like I said, like I was mentioning earlier, there are issues that they will have to sort out. And I'm, I'm not sure at this point. I'll guess I'll be attending the press conference at 8.30, and they could probably iron out how these issues could affect the final tabulation. Okay, thank you very much, Javon. Finally, before you go, though, can you tell us what is the mood in Guyana at this point in time? Well, from since, the, from since 6 to right now, um, it's quiet. It's really quiet. Um, I always, I, like I was telling my driver earlier, one of the things that you find around elections time is that the night of elections, it's very quiet. The, and before the morning early, it's quiet. Nighttime, it's quiet. So it's very quiet. Um, except for what's going on on the East Coast. Um, hopefully, they can have that situation under control. But for the city, it's very quiet. Okay, thank you very much, Javon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, of course, you had the presidential candidates for the two main parties, APNU and PPP Civic, expressing confidence of victory going into elections this morning. And during the day, they spoke to the media about their feelings. I'm very confident that uh, the party which I lead, the coalition which I lead, will be successful. And I'm confident also that the process which has been put in place by the Elections Commission under the chairmanship of Justice Pradit Singh will be efficient. Uh, the observers are in the country from all around the world. And uh, Guyana today will demonstrate that it's a democratic country and it is capable of conducting elections efficiently and credibly um, in accordance with the law and the constitution. How do you plan to spend the rest of your day? Uh, I am, um, of course I have duties to perform. I, I am an agent and I will be going to other polling stations uh, to ensure that the process is smooth and without uh, complaint uh, by persons of all uh, parties. And um, after that, I will quietly, uh, in the bosom of the coalition, await the results. Of course, that was President David Granger, and next we'll hear from Irfan Ali, the presidential candidate for the PPP Civic. This is a very simple process, um, and it went smoothly. I was able to cast my ballot. We have, a lot in this region, and the report from around the country is that um, the day started, with a good turnout early in the morning but there were some hiccups that we haven't done a full assessment of as yet um, in some areas people complain that the information they receive from the desk clerk the information clerk uh, the gcom information clerk is confusing uh, so we are addressing a lot of that um, so later in the day we'll have a full assessment it's still early <laughs> um, as to what is going on there and as you know, um, the, a decision was taken to, for the executive vote not to do its normal trips today. So we had to put some systems in place to assist voters who wanted to get back to executive to vote. But um, so far this morning, we are on track. We're very confident. Our supporters are coming out in their numbers. And I think we are heading uh, for victory today. Both presidential candidates saying that voting was smooth and they're both confident of victory as expected. Um, we talked earlier about the difference between President Granger and the PPP civic candidate Irfan Ali. Um, I'm going to give both of you an opportunity um, to speak more about that. And because we have Granger, who is well known, who is politically been, he's been in the political 
trenches for a while, and you have Irfan Ali, who we don't really see that much um, when it comes to the PPP Civic making its voice heard. The spokesperson is usually former President Barrett Jagdeo. Um, so in addition to assessing the candidates and comparing them, comparing them um, I also want you to talk about how that strategy of having Jagdeo speaking on behalf of the PPP at a time when they're trying to, to encourage people to vote for Irfan Ali as president, mm -hmm. how that has um, affected their campaign. Mm -hmm. No, it, 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 was, it was fascinating for me to, to see how it was unfolding. Um, the, the person who brought the vote of no confidence was President Jagdeo. Um, my assumption is that President Jagdeo felt confident that the court challenge that was mounted would have succeeded and he would have been able to run again as president. My, my assumption is that that was his thinking um, because he piloted the entire thing. You know, after that, they came up with this in front alley who I had never really heard from, heard of before, and I, I admit that I am not living in Guyana and not aware of all of the political machinations. But he came out as the candidate that was preferred, and I was fascinated that you know he was the person that they had gone with. But he didn't seem to have the sparkle. He didn't seem to have the sparkle of a of a president uh, Jagdeo. Uh, and our, well, we, I, re I refer to him as president. I think that that's the convention yes, in Guyana. Yeah, he, yes. he carries the title, as as, as he should. Um, yeah, I don't think he ever had that sparkle. And you know, ultimately, he came out, and it'll be interesting to see how people respond to him. But it was a, it was a Putin move. You know, we we saw that in the uh, in in Russia, where President Putin was uh, prohibited from running again. Um, he essentially ran as prime ministerial candidate. Uh, he got elected in that way, someone else was president, they changed the constitution and, and, and Putin is back. You know, even though the, the law has stated before that no person could run um, more than twice in, in, in the case of, of Russia. I wondered whether that was the kind of strategy that President Jagdeo had in mind and whether we may see his rebirth in politics uh, subsequently if, if the PPP Civic is, is successful tonight. Uh, he may try to pull a Putin move, uh, and if that is the case, then he may re-emerge as president. But um, yeah, it's fairly clear that he was the spokesperson. He was the person that people looked to because ultimately he was the president. And you know, as I said, he was a relatively successful president. And I think that against that background, the expectation was for many people that he would have been the person leading. The, the alternative is uh, President Granger, and he is, um, you know, my colleague can speak probably better to him because I assume that you may know him personally. But um, I was a bit surprised when he was identified as a presidential candidate because I, I knew nothing of him politically. Uh, I did a poll in Guyana uh, during the last election or the one before that, and his name came up as an option. And I was a bit surprised because um, I never knew him to be a politician. I mean, ultimately, he was an army person, a brigadier in the army. Um, he was not a political type. And I think in many ways, he was drafted in because the uh, coalition needed somebody like him who didn't have a lot of political baggage, who was a straight shooter and a straight talker, and somebody who was honest. Because I think it was a nice comparison to the alternative leadership that appeared to be a slightly more creative kind of with, with the truth and, and, and you know in terms of doing business. So those seem to have been his attributes. He was not a political type. And as I said, I, I didn't know a whole lot about him before he was mentioned as an option in terms of one of the political polls that I did. And then he, he subsequently succeeded in being chosen. Um, we, we have had a, a lot of confusion regarding coalition politics in Guyana. I mean, it has been a complex arrangement. The, the PNC, as we know it, became the PNCR. Uh, it then morphed into the APNU by adding other small parties and so on along the way. And everywhere there has been a coalition. And in that process, the AFC broke away. And the AFC was essentially uh, progressive elements of both the PNC and the PDP. Uh, and so we have all of that together now. I mean, when you add all of these small component parts with different philosophical and different personality politics, you need a, a moderate centralizing figure. And I think that's what ultimately um, Brigadier uh, you know, Granger is. He is a, he is a, a moderate figure, um, and he is, fortunately for him, somebody who is renowned for being a very honest guy, um, honest to, to a fault, it would seem. Uh, and those seem to be his calling cards. The, the challenge that President Granger has had is that he's not political. He's not a politician. 
So, um, you know, and, and I have been critical of the fact that the, the whole um, breakaway was allowed to happen in the first place, the coalition, the, um, the sorry, the vote of no confidence. Because my sense is that a, a good, astute leader should be on top of things. And I appreciate that he was unwell at the time. But on top of things to the point that if you see a movement, and, and I mean, the gentleman did say that he was having some challenges and trying to raise some issues, you need to be able to manage those things. But as I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that he would have learned his lesson that, yes, you know, you can be honest and you can be decent and you can be all these things. But if this is politics, you ought to play the game. And you need to be able to manage uh, a coalition. And it's a fragile coalition. As I said, it's a broad set of parties and, and interests and so on. You have to bring them together. But you have to constantly be working to manage them and knitting them together in that kind of way. So it's, it's an interesting contrast of personalities. Uh, and I think that he has brought something to Caribbean politics that we have not known a lot about. Because there have not been many figures like him that have come to the fore, uh, and even less of them that have succeeded. You know, I compare him with uh, Prime Minister Stuart in Barbados, with uh, Tillman Thomas, Prime Minister Thomas in, in Guyana, um, both of whom had that same kind of decent personality type that came to the fore, uh, and very non-political, non-controversial. And, and, and sadly, the other two have not fared very well. I think that his experience will be different, um, largely because he is uh, probably a little more active and he's dealing with uh, a different situation in Guyana, one of coalition politics, one of tremendous wealth, and one in which people are, uh, are acutely more concerned about the future and the fact that they do not want to place that 85% that economic growth in the hands of the wrong person. Well, you said 200 million US dollars a day potentially. They don't want to place that in the hand of the wrong person because it can be it can be tragic, and I think that that's the the sense that people are going out to vote with. And very quickly, um, you were talking about some of the issues that people were concerned about, and yeah, I mean, wealth was the key thing that was really what people's ultimate concern about. But at the basic level, um, the issues of employment, you know, is is a big thing. Uh, employment and healthcare, in many instances, um, those were some of the key things that people mentioned as being you know, issues of, of concern to them. Uh, employment, uh, health care, I mean roads and stuff like that is always going to be a problem, especially in the case of Guyana, um, where they have certain structural challenges to road building and road maintenance that the rest of us in the Caribbean don't have. So, um, you know, those kinds of concerns were, were normal. I mean, those can be dealt with fairly easily in the context of the kind of money that they have at their disposal. But I think that employment, I think that health care, uh, and clearly education seem to be uh, paramount in terms of the focus of the political parties and the feeling that these are the issues that people want want addressed you know in fairly short order um, announcements have been made regarding you know a new georgetown hospital uh, it's an excellent idea i think that's an excellent place to start when you're spending money uh, education grants have been talked about again responding to some of the key issues and you know, in, in that kind of economic growth, employment takes care of itself because people will get jobs. <laughs> you know, they definitely will get jobs. So. Go ahead, Mr. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, um, mm -hmm. I, I really, <coughs> excuse me, I really cannot add uh, very much to, mm -hmm. to that analysis because everything that Mr. Rickman mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. president is true. Um, he's a man of, of substantial honor and this and one of the things he brings to force to the table is discipline as an army person uh, discipline is one of the things that is very necessary in in our community in our society uh, there has been an element of a, a breakdown in law and order in a way that perhaps is unfortunate and the president is the kind of person who can restore Guyana to the position of discipline that it once enjoyed. Um, and he is vastly better known than Mr. Ali. Even I know very little about Mr. Ali. And of course, if, um, if Mr. Jagdeo has a Putin uh, twist <laughs> in mind, he has a little bit of a problem because the, the Constitution of Guyana can only be changed with a two-thirds majority of the House. And there's no possibility of either party having two-thirds majority in the House. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Jagdeo may as well forget any idea 
about changing the Constitution and coming back if that was his intention. But what is clear is that the, the, the presidential candidate is within his control and is, is a product of his in a lot of ways. And that he is the person calling the shots. That is very clear as to whether he will continue to be allowed to call the shots by him. Because the interesting thing about the guy in the Constitution is also this, that if by any mischance Mr. Ali became president, he could completely ignore Mr. Jack Dio, and he could do absolutely nothing yeah. about it. Um, but with, with any objective analysis of those two gentlemen would suggest very clearly that, that President Granger is the kind of person on whom you could rely in a way that is necessary for, for a president of Guyana, especially in the oil era. Um, oil is going to make a tremendous and total change in Guyana. And the person responsible, the person responsible for the government of, of the day while oil is, is flowing will be a major player. And um, Mr. Ali is not known to be, as far as I'm aware, the kind of person who perhaps could do that kind of uh, job. Um, and if, I, I, if the people of Guyana were to compare President Granger as against Mr. Ali, objectively, I'd be quite surprised if they would think that Mr. Ali was superior in any kind of way. But, yeah. as I said earlier on, politics is a strange art. And um, decency is not always recognized, <laughs> as some of my Bayesian uh, mm. friends might remember. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, one has to see how this whole scenario will play out. Mm. But I would be very surprised if, if the final word was that Mr. Ali, who is known in some quarters but unknown in others, mm. was selected as a, as a person who Guyanese wanted to lead Guyana into the oil era. Mm. Well, that takes us into the next point, because um, in addition to being relatively unknown, he also has some legal troubles. Um, do you think that the choice of candidate for the PPP has effectively hurt their chances of winning this election? Well, I'm adv I, I am advised that the answer to you is yes. I'm not there myself, and I can't. I, have, I cannot give you a personal opinion. But the word is that, the <coughs> that yes, choice, the choice has been unfortunate in those terms. And, and even in terms of what Guyanese will see as his people, um, I'm told a lot of the people who normally support the PPP are not happy with that choice for th those reasons and others. Um, so perhaps President Jagdio has miscalculated, even though, like we have said, Mr. Ali is clearly under his tutelage. Um, perhaps it may turn out that it wasn't his advantage to maneuver the situation in such a way that the party chose Mr. Ali as its presidential candidate. That may turn out to be not have been a good choice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I don't know, I'm a little bit more um, skeptical in terms of that analysis. And, and this is why um, President Jagdio, President Jagdio is no fool. Um, my assumption is that he's analyzed the situation and he has made a deliberate judgment in terms of his choice because I think we appreciate ultimately it would have been his choice. 
I, I believe that he would have made a deliberate judgment in full knowledge of all of the challenges that, that Infranali faces legally. Um, you know, I think the idea of it being a slam dunk that, you know, you made a bad choice and, you know, as a result, the, the, the individual that has been put there is um, ultimately going to lose the election for you. Oh, no, 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 not that, not that. Not right. That. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something that I am, I am a bit skeptical about. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is that I've seen leaders and I've seen uh, individuals in politics with all kinds of legal troubles, but the question is whether or not people really care. Um, you look at a man like President, that President, um, President, the current President of the United States, um, Trump, President Trump, who is went into the election with all kinds of issues, issues of, of, of moral turpitude, issues of financial turpitude, um, who we all knew would have been facing legal challenges going into the White House, and he won the election notwithstanding. Because I think when it comes down to it at a certain level, people are willing to ignore these things and vote for, for a thing. Look, look at the fact that the PPP Civic has, uh, let's say, 49% or 49 point something percent of the total popular vote in, in Guyana. And they would have had that historically. I mean, my sense is that even if one or two percentage points were shed as a result of the fact that people that, is, is it true that those people are necessarily going to be unhappy enough to go and vote on the other side, or will they vote loyally? I mean, we, we had in this region, you know, talk of, of crapples and dead dogs. And I think that for most of us in Trinidad and Barbados, we know the language is one that says that you vote for a person based on the party, not necessarily who the individual is. And that's where Eric Williams could speak about crapples. And, and uh, our bar was able to speak about dead dogs, because ultimately people will vote in that way. And they're not really seeing in front Ali for anything other than a representative of the PPP Civic. And you can rest assured that if he became president next week, uh, Wednesday, all of those legal troubles would disappear. You know? So the question is really whether people who are willing to vote for him really care. And then the question as to whether or not the um, PPP Civic has made a deliberate judgment, understood the issues going in, and said, look, we will go with him notwithstanding because we believe that we can overcome uh, in, in some way or the other. Okay. Sure. 30 seconds, final sure. comments from both of you. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead, Mr. Um, no, I mean, this, this is an exciting election, you know, one that comes on the heel of uh, a breakup of a government, a uh, vote of no confidence, and I'm anxious to see whether the trend that has held in all other instances when this has happened will hold true. I'm inclined to think that it won't, and that President, Jagdeo, President Granger will retain office. Uh, however, I am um, essentially sitting tight and I wait for the, the final uh, information that comes forth to see what happens. Well, it is my hope that... Mm -hmm. The elections will turn out to be peaceful, orderly, that there will be no disturbances of any type to disrupt the process. I have every confidence that uh, Guyana will rise to the challenge of the present day and um, that the political parties will be, show the kind of responsibility that we mm -hmm. expect of them. I, I, I have great faith in the future of Guyana, and it is my confident expectation that tomorrow will be better for Guyanese than yesterday was. Thank you okay. so very much. We had a very interesting discussion here as Guyana votes, and uh, we encourage you to stay here with us on Carib Vision as we rejoin NCN Guyana for continued coverage of the Guyana elections. I'm Don Paris. Do have a good evening.